Okay. So if you go to the course wiki, uh, there are two new sections. And the first one is called projects. And it is a description of the tasks that we will do in groups. Okay. Um, so the idea is as follows. We will have three groups. Um, at the top level, we will have kind of a, a requirement spe specification. And this is what you do when you design kind of a new application. You kind of specify all the requirements that go into that, um, that application. Um, so we will have kind of a UI, we'll have some um, uh, functional requirements like do we want a group chat versus individual only and so on. So there will be a number of, um, of things that are kind of um, designed for the requirements. So it's basically what to do, right? Not how to do it, but what is required. Uh, and those are functional and non-functional requirements, and they are kind of um, specified um, in, a, in a short list. And the idea is that the group which will be tackling that will sort of try to answer all those, all those questions. So we have um, the UI, we have the individual group chat, how the users are identifying themselves, how we're trying to prevent civil attacks, um, how to maintain privacy for communication while making sure that it's usable, that you can actually chat with who you want, and so on, right? Uh, and then, what are the privacy implications of all the decisions? Um, so some decisions um, might have performance implications or privacy implications, and there is always a trade-off. So in the report, you kind of analyze and discuss all those, all those trade-offs. So for example, um, yeah, let, let me just finish this picture. So that's kind of the, the top level uh, top level group. And then we will have how to do that, right? So then we have a se second group, which is doing kind of a technical spec. And this is what is kind of given to developers. Imagine that there is a development team somewhere, somewhere else. And then that's what we give them to actually do, right? So the, the second group will be investigating how to implement it. What libraries to use, what languages to use, what tools to use, how to do routing, how to do authentication and authorization, and so on. So there is, again, a number of questions um, which relate to the technical specification of what transport technology to use? Should the app communicate over Bluetooth, over Wi-Fi, over Wi-Fi Direct? Uh, should we? Uh, how should we do the peer-to-peer -peer connectivity? Uh, what's the topology of the network? Uh, what authentication we will use? What libraries we will use, and so on. And it also has some privacy implications and some scalability and performance implications. So, for example, you may say. Uh, for this one, you may say, let's use some kind of a peer-to-peer -peer library, which creates a mesh network, and the mesh network basically has some peers, uh, which uh, are connected with each other. So you may have one node which is connected with just one neighbor, but this has three neighbors, right? So this node has uh, three neighbors, and then this one has two, and so on, right? It's not, it's not a full mesh, but it's kind of like mesh-like network. And now, let's say this is node A, and this is node B. So the question is how the message will go from A to B. You have to route it. You have to route it through some hops. So obviously you have to go to this one because that's your only neighbor you have from A. And then what happens? So one typical algorithm is to flood the network. So this node, node uh, no, it's not B, B is here, so let's call this one, uh, yeah, so let's rename it, so it's A, B, C, D, E, F, right? So A wants to send a message to F, 
and then a message goes to B. And then one algorithm might be that we flood the network. So B tells all its neighbors uh, there is a message. Uh, so it sends the message uh, to C, to D, and to E, right? Um, so the message from A kind of gets to those three nodes. And then each of them kind of up again floods the network, right? So E will kind of send the message again to D, to F, and because E got it from D, it will not send it back, right? So we don't send the message back, but we send to those who haven't got it. So in the first, so that's the first iteration of the algorithm, and then this is the second iteration, right? So in the second iteration, and also C will send it to here, right? Um, so we have a, 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 like this one, this one, and this one is in the, uh, and this one is in the third, second iteration. Um, so you will notice that D got it originally in the first iteration, and then got it twice again because of the flooding. So this is kind of inefficient, but uh, D can ignore those those additional messages. So D will say, okay, I've already seen it, so I don't care about this. I've already seen it, so I don't care about this, right? And D will uh, not propagate it to whoever sent it to. Uh, it will only propagate to the one node or neighbor that didn't send it, right? So this kind of a flooding is one uh, possible algorithms that white one might use, but it has kind of a performance implications and security implications, right? So from performance, it kind of sucks uh, because uh, we have duplicated messages, right? Uh, so if we cut some routing and for example, B announced that B has uh, C, D, and E, C, D, E. So B announced, I see those neighbors. And then B announced, I see C, D, F, E, right? Then when those announcements kind of showed up, A could see, well, I can send my message to F through B and D because B can see D and D can see F, right? So it can kind of design a path which says, okay, I only need to send the message to here. This will send the message here and so on, right? So the kind of, um, let's call it routing table, right? Routing table algorithm is much nicer in terms of uh, performance because we don't have duplicated messages. But what implication this one and this one has in terms of security or privacy? Yeah? So with the flooding, I wouldn't have to write again to your message. So theoretically, everybody can, like, when there's one or two full nodes, they yeah. can gather information that should not have. Or should not have if the it's not directed to to this Correct. Case. Yeah. And in the second case? Uh, only the nodes along the path can send it. That's right. So in the in the routing case, only the this node and this node will see that some there was some communication between A and F, right? In the case of flooding everybody kind of sees everything, right? So you need to take care of um, uh, of making sure that you kind of obscure the messages so much that nobody actually see anything and, you know, only the recipient sees it, right? So imagine that with the flooding algorithm, what we did, we encrypted the message entirely with the F public key, right? So we, we're sending a message, which is just an encrypted binary block right? And only F can decrypt it. So everybody can see it, but nobody can see what's inside. And only F, once it gets it, can kind of decrypt it because F has the, the private key for the, for the message, right? So now everybody sees the message, but nobody can see what it is for, from whom or to whom, uh, because nobody can decrypt it, right? Only, only F can decrypt it. Yeah? Everybody has to try to decrypt every message. Yes, exactly. That's right. 
So that would mean everybody would need to try to decrypt every message that, that they see to see just in case it's for them, right? Before passing it to them, right? So is that, so it kind of fixes the privacy problem, uh, but then again, we have, um, um, we have the performance issue because everybody now needs to try to decrypt everything and then everybody kind of, uh, there, there is a lot of flooding, right? So it's inefficient, right? Yeah? That's right. So you could, uh, you could combine them with some sort of metadata, right? So what security or privacy implication would that have? Mm -hmm. I think we, for a very basic word, we need a system, a system for the volunteer uh, name or this will this name is here. Mm -hmm. the system for the data, data, data. Uh, and then if you don't write uh, also a privacy standard, uh, then there is only the implication that you know that there is a message for somebody. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So that that's one one good idea. So the the point here is we have the the sender and the recipient, right? Recipient. Um, so if we make those, if we make both public, then nodes along the path can learn that A is communicating with F, right? Uh, that is undesirable feature. Like nobody should learn that F and A are talking with each other, right? Exactly. So the idea was let's omit the sender. We only keep the recipient. So then what people will learn that, for example, F is getting a lot of messages, right? Well, it's a trade-off, right? We can't have everything. We cannot have a perfect efficient system with perfect privacy uh, because that's not possible, right? We can have inefficient system with, uh, you know, re really good privacy or we can have some trade-offs, right? So if we hide the sender and we only have the recipient, we're still leaking some information. So there is still kind of a knowledge that let's say one of those nodes gets a lot of messages, right? Uh, that information is leaking, but that might be acceptable, right? So depending on like how far you want to go with privacy and security, you may kind of make some decisions where you say, yeah, okay, we are le leaking some information about which of the nodes gets a lot of messages, but we still don't know from whom, right? And that's okay. Maybe there is just um, two nodes sending messages, right? Um, yeah? Mm -hmm. Exactly. So one, one technique for obfuscating this metadata and, and routing is exactly what you said. Basically sending, you know, random messages to random nodes to kind of uh, mislead whoever is observing the traffic, like what is really going on, right? And some messages have data, some messages don't have data, right? So for example, if I always send messages you know, every 15 minutes or every hour between A and F, then nobody can tell if I'm really communicating or it's just empty messages, right? Uh, that's what the uh, Alice and, and Germans were doing during the Second World War. They had kind of a, communica a fixed communication schedule and sometimes they were real messages in those schedules and most of the time it was just rubbish, right? And that was to prevent the decryption team to kind of learning what they were doing because some messages were basically rubbish and then if you try to use it for learning what the keys were, you, you will kind of mess them up, right? Uh, because they knew it like the, the communication was kind of always at a particular time and sometimes there was message, but most of the time it was just rubbish, right? Um, so we could use something like this here. So there are kind of different ideas 
uh, of how to do the routing and how to do the security. And uh, there are always trade-offs. So if we do random messages, again, we sacrificing performance because we generate more traffic, right? Uh, and if we are, let's say you are on a stadium, there is 10,000 people with mobile devices, you connect it to a couple of uh, Bluetooth uh, neighbors, and you're kind of flooding the network, then we can imagine that it could potentially generate a lot of traffic, right? Uh, so for small network, if you have uh, a small network of, of nodes, and you want to obfuscate who is communicating with whom, a certain level of uh, inefficiency is desirable, because you want to kind of obfuscate the communication. But if your, um, yeah, so let, let's make this <laughs> small here. And then for the large network, where we have a lot of nodes, we have, you know, uh, 10,000 nodes, and here we have 10 nodes. So the fact that there is a 10,000 nodes already creates a lot of obfuscation, right? Uh, because there is already quite a lot of noise just by the sheer number of participants, right? So we should not try to introduce additional noise because then it just blows up. Uh, so there are different decisions for large networks where you have a large amount of participants and for small ones. Um, because in here, we really need to introduce a lot of noise because there is not enough noise in the network itself, right? Um, there is also a question of... Um, um, like... So, coming back to this original example, right? Uh, so we had A communicating with B, going to D, and then going to F, right? So we had kind of a path like this. That's a trusted node, and that's a trusted node, because they want to communicate, so they trust each other, right? Uh, B and D, we don't know, right? So if B and D are also trusted, and they don't sniff any traffic, or they don't do any analysis, then no information kind of leaks. But if D is compromised, and D is kind of observing who sends stuff to whom, right? So then D logs, okay, uh, B was communicating to F. So D doesn't know the original source, but it knows that it's either B or some of the B, B neighbors, right? Because D kind of logged, somebody was communicating to F, and I got the message from D, right? Uh, so over time, D can learn a little bit about who is communicating with whom, especially if there is another compromised node, which is also part of the path, right? So the question is, if you have compromised nodes which are trying to learn or kind of leak some privacy information, what is the, so what's the ratio of, um, of good nodes versus the, the bad compromised nodes, right? Uh, if that ratio is quite good, which means there is a small number of bad nodes in the network, we don't need so much um, uh, privacy considerations because most of the most of the nodes will be kind of playing fair, and the uh, leaking of the private information is not as severe. But if this ratio kind of uh, gets kind of severe if kind of half of those nodes is, you know, bad behaving, uh, then we have a problem, right? No matter what we do, we will still leak some information uh, about who is communicating with whom. Um, so, I mean, your, your task is to kind of analyze what are the trade-offs and make some decisions, right? So at the end of the day, we have to kind of decide where the trade-offs are and why, and what assumptions are we making? So are we making enough so, so here is, are we making an app for a classroom, for a groups of people up to 50, let's say? Uh, or are we making an, an app for a stadium which has, you know, 10,000 or 30,000 people uh, potentially communicating with each other, right? So size, expected size of the network. And what implications does it have to the, to the decisions that we are making? Um, so that's the that's the kind of um, one and two, and then we have the third group, and the third group is the implementation, right? So then we have the actual implementation group, 
which tries to build a prototype, right? Uh, and the idea is that you, um, th there will be kind of a people in this, and this group in the first iteration, and then we swap, right? So some people will change the groups and some people will go to here, right? So you have to sign yourself up um, to the groups page and you have to pick um, whether you are doing the requirement spec first and technical spec second or other way around, right? Um, so on first come first serve basis, so we are like uh, three, five, about 10 people. So I would say if there are three people already in one of the groups, then I will move the remaining ones down, right? So whoever is first kind of has a more chance of staying there. If there is too many people in one of those groups, I will kind of move them to the, to the other one. So we have balanced groups, right? Um, so we have balanced groups for stage one under requirements and tech spec. And then in the stage two, those people will need to change and they can either change to the other uh, group or they can go to prototype, right? So in the prototype, there is no stage one. Uh, there is no stage one for prototype implementation. We only have people in the second phase, right? Um, however, there is additional role. Additional role is a project lead. Uh, a project lead is a person who will stay in that group forever, right? So a project lead is a person who will be kind of organizing the group and staying in the group for both stages. So we will have one project lead for uh, requirement spec, one project lead for technical spec, and whoever wants, this is optional, can become a project lead for the implementation and also stay there for two stages, right? So we have kind of a concept of somebody staying there, so then when new people come, that person will kind of tell the newcomers of what happened and so on, right? So we have some sort of continuity. Does it make sense? So I like if someone wants to be a leader, you can put yourself already as a leader, but if nobody wants to be a leader, you can just elect the leader like from the group, right? Um, but at, you know, at the at the end of stage one, one person will stay with that uh, requirement spec, technical spec, or uh, if there was nobody here, then, you know, that doesn't matter because then we just have uh, stage two, right? Um, does it make sense? Yeah? Correct, that's correct. So you place your name in two places for stage one and stage two. Uh, and then if you already are sure that you want to be kind of hacking away and implementing stuff, then you can put yourself as a project lead in the implementation and then you will stay there for two stages, right? So people who want to implement, they can be here for both stages, yeah? Yeah, so you basically have to uh, investigate what tools to use, how to organize the workflow, how to organize the build system, uh, potentially do a little bit of investigations together with the tech group, uh, what libraries to use. Uh, so you kind of have a little bit more freedom of, um, of the tech stack, but um, yeah, so it, it is, um, of course, this one depends on this one, right? And this one depends on this one. So the dependency is that should happen first, right? That should happen second, and then this should happen, right? It's kind of a, it's a very uh, water flow project, right? Um, so we can't really do this without knowing this, and we can't really start implementing without knowing the, the decisions here. But um, you can kind of imagine because we have the two stages, we have kind of like two sprints, and we can try to do things in parallel. Uh, so some explorations are kind of a more funnel, right? So um, so this, um, let's say this is the kind of the exploration stage for stage one, 
and this is the exploration stage for this for stage one and the same is kind of here you have kind of a broad choice and then after stage one this will get kind of constrained so we will have some sort of a spec that is already quite defined after stage one finishes here which will kind of limit of what can happen in, in stage um, in the technical space but also uh, this kind of uh, limits of what we are kind of implementing but it's not a linear process because like the team with or the, the person who's kind of investigating here may say um, in Bluetooth we cannot do certain things like I know I, I was kind of checking and in Bluetooth we cannot for example in Bluetooth um, normal one you cannot hook up uh, automatically without the user uh, interacting right so if these guys are saying let's use Bluetooth and this guy is saying well you cannot do Bluetooth without user interacting and accepting all the connections right because the rendezvous between two devices requires the user intervention right it cannot just happen uh, kind of uh, underneath the, the surface uh, then you kind of have you have to iterate right so even though we kind of putting this structure into the project it is kind of more like a, a agile project which needs kind of iterating over so what these people will do in the first stage well they will kind of do similar things to the to the tech spec group but these guys need to implement something and they need to have code these guys will have a report right so they don't really implement things they kind of uh, check literature and check technical uh, reports and documentation and they provide like a report these guys don't need to write a report and they don't need to do presentation they need to implement try to implement something put something in right so the, there is a kind of a bonus for the implementation team uh, if there are people in the first stage that there is no report and no presentation required for people who are doing the, the implementation in the first stage right um, because they need to do a little bit more more work because they need to do kind of the work of these guys plus they need to implement right uh, because they're kind of starting from zero uh, once the first stage finishes then there will be some documents about this and some documents about that so the implementation team can kind of uh, refine and do more more work right uh, those are loosely coupled you don't need to implement what this report says after stage one right uh, at the end of the day it is kind of a little bit loosely coupled so you can use the uh, information from the reports but you don't have to do that here um, so yes so you're putting your name into two, two places uh, you're putting your name into stage one um, and stage two and then whoever wants to stay in the same group for both stages puts the name as the project lead if there is more than one then you kind of negotiate I would like to have only one for the requirements and for the tech spec but the people who start implementing now they can stay for stage two right so they will become kind of a de facto project leads uh, for the implementation and then after stage one you need to change so whoever is here or here needs to go either here or here or go to implementation right questions Yeah. How do we do? Yeah. So you used. Uh, you should have a uh, developer access to be able to modify this wiki. It's on the wiki. Just put your name on the wiki, right? Uh, so use the GitLab wiki to to do this. Um, for so for this, it's kind of just a group page. So you just click edit and you put your names here. Um, if you go to the main project, uh, there is a repo now, which is empty. Um, yeah, it has a, a single readme file. And I will populate the repo with the initial uh, Android Studio project. So is, is somebody interested in doing the development from stage one? All right, cool. So um, I I am wondering how to organize it. So uh, because you may want to play a little bit with the um, 
kind of a different technologies, like for example for routing algorithms or so on, right? So we'll have kind of a root folder, and then we will have kind of an Android Studio project. So let's say we have an Android Studio project with that kind of a mobile application. And then you may want to have some folders where you want kind of a um, stuff that is for routing or for authentication or for playing with the IDs or whatever, right? Whatever you want, right? Um, so this organization of the code is kind of up to you. Uh, you can kind of organize yourself into different folders. Uh, and then of course you can use branches as well, right? So, um, and we will use the issue tracker for the course. So there is an issue tracker in the course, which you can create specific labels for yourself and kind of use the issue tracker to coordinate some of the development work. <clears throat> so the developers will use this repo with some sort of a structure for your, for your project. You, you make your decisions, like uh, you, you were the one interested in iOS. You, yeah, so you may have kind of an iOS folder that, where you have your iOS code base, right? We only have one repo, right? So unfortunately, um, we like it's a little bit uh, difficult with GitLab to reorganize it to have multiple repos, and for the sake, it, it will be a small prototype. So for the sake of exploring it, let's just have a single repo with folders for different bits and pieces, right? So if you want kind of an Android project, you you say Android and you have Android stuff. If you want iOS, you put iOS and have iOS stuff, right? Um, up to you. Uh, it's just that it will be single repo and you have to use folders and branches to kind of isolate different bits and pieces, pieces, right? So if you want, you could have a branch which is iOS and only have iOS stuff there, right? Uh, that's, that's fine as well. Uh, so the way you want to organize it, it's kind of up to you. Sure. Um, so if you're not yet in the in the course, then just request the, um, so what's your, uh, what's your GitLab name? Do you see the kind of uh, request access button? Then I should see your request. That's you. And it's done. So, um, anyone else is missing access? Perfect, yeah. So put, put your names, um, put your names on the wiki. Uh, we will um, communicate over um, Discord if I need to move people around, if the groups are completely imbalanced. Uh, and then the developers can organize the repo and the way they kind of want to work themselves. And then the groups organize themselves as well. Uh, at the end of stage one, what's, what's required is... Um, we will have presentations, so each group, apart from the developers, will present what they kind of found out. Um, so you will kind of, um, on, on Monday 23rd of March, you will kind of uh, submit the report, the group report, and then you will kind of make a presentation. It's a kind of a group, group thing. So it's just one report, so we will have two reports, right? On 23rd of March, we will have two reports for the requirement group and for the tech spec group. Um, and then for the um, stage two, we will also have two reports and we will have the presentations and we'll have a presentation for the, uh, for the developer group. Um, and at the end, everybody will do their reflections, right? 
So you don't need to make a report. At the end, you just kind of uh, have a reflection on your learning and on what you contributed and so on. So kind of individual reflection, uh, short individual reflection report at the end. So everybody will kind of contribute to three things, uh, two group reports and then the individual one. The developers will have to write a final report for the, like after stage two. Uh, so there will be like a technical report of what has been developed and what was done. Uh, and they will make a presentation as well. And they will have um, the individual kind of uh, reflections as well. So they will have, the developers will have one report, one reflection document and the code, right? So they also have three things, right? Uh, Non-developers have three things and developers have three things. It's just that the non-developers instead of code have an additional report, right? Make sense? All right. Um, so that's pretty much all logistics about the, uh, the project. And the final stage two, I have to check because we have Easter and then we have the, the end of semester and I also want to give us like a, a, a week for wrapping up. So I will put the final date um, for the stage two. It will be kind of like one or two weeks before the, the end of semester, right? Um, so it will be kind of at the end. The middle one is 23rd of March, but the end one I will try to keep like one week before the end of course. Uh, any questions about this? It is a little bit hard to, to split it this way as we are explaining here because they kind of depend on each other, right? Uh, so I'm not saying the implementation group should not talk to, to tech group or vice versa, right? You, should, you can all talk to each other. It's just that these guys need to prepare one report which is focused on what should be kind of functional and non-functional requirements, requirements for the app. These guys need to make a report of what's available, what other systems are using, what are the libraries available, and so on and so forth. Uh, and then these guys are trying things out. So it is time consuming to try things out. And you may want to try those things out or you may try to want something else out. It's kind of up to you, right? Uh, so you have quite a lot of freedom of what and how, how you do it. It's just that logically these guys in stage one is doing some code. These guys are doing reports and this is more high level reports of what is required but not how to achieve it. And then this one is uh, what's available to build things, right? Because this group doesn't have all the details of what to build, um, they are kind of exploring the space a little bit wider, right? So they can check different authentication or authorization algorithms or different um, uh, routing systems and so on. So it, it is kind of like what, what is listed here. You have to make some decisions at the end of the day, you have to make some decisions in each of the, of the stages. And those decisions is fine if they are conflicting, right? Uh, so if some of the decisions are made here, which contradict what this group is saying, that's fine we will kind of clear it up in stage two, right? So in stage one, it's more exploration. You kind of go a little bit wider and then you kind of uh, refocus in stage two, right? Um, so it's kind of a more exploration stage and then you kind of are uh, going back to, um, to be more precise and kind of uh, weed out some of the auxiliary things uh, in stage two. Yeah. To get access to the wiki, yeah, you you need to request access, and then I just give you access if you have a GitLab um, user. Did you request it access already? Yeah. So those, if, if you do, uh, there is like a small button clo at the top which says request access. Um, yeah. So the link is um, so you you go to Git git yovic ed ntnu uh, slash course slash imt4306 and then you will have the, the year which is our our course and that's the project that you are requesting access to so I can't 
yes if I just go here I can yes let me yeah the best way for this to work is maybe to go to wiki and yeah so that's the that is the url so the url is git yovig edntnu.no course slash int3 4306 slash same IMT4306-2020 and then if you go there, there there is like at the top there is a request access button so here is the wiki the repo and everything it's kind of a URL to the project to the GitLab project And then if you do request access, then I grant it. I occasionally check it. If I don't check it, then you can uh, bug me on Discord. You can say, oh, Marius, can you grant me access? But if you do it now, I can give you access now. So... Um, are you on Discord? Yeah. Yeah, so I will share it on Discord. All right, so let's have a break. Let's have a 10 minutes break. Yeah, so you want to type it? Yeah, I can show you here. Oops, sorry. Yeah. But you don't need the rest. You only need mm -hmm. to this 2020. Yeah. Oh, about this. Course. Yeah. And now request access. Oh, nice. Perfect. So, if I refresh, I should have you, and then, yep. You in. Okay, thank you. You're welcome.
All right. So let's um, briefly discuss the the kind of a tech stack that is needed for this for this application. So, are you familiar with the uh, networking OSI layers? Who is, who is familiar with, uh, yeah? So OSI layers. So what's the, what's layer one? Yeah. You remember? Something nice. <coughs> so, for example, this one. So, I don't need to draw it. All right, so. Let me change that. Right, so layer one is a physical layer, right? Then we have data link, um, which is, let, let's say we're doing HTTP request, right? So I'm doing a HTTP request to the GitLab to get the HTTP page for the week, right? Um, so what happens? On the very lowest level, the, the electrical signals need to tra you know, travel somehow, right? Um, using Wi-Fi, so the, the physical layer is actually using uh, radio waves, right? Um, so we need some sort of medium of communication. It could be radio waves, could be uh, copper cable, could be fiber optic cable, can be something, right? So that's the physical layer. And then we have a data link layer. So the data link layer is the uh, Ethernet card which talks uh, with the switch, right? So in my case, it's my Ethernet card which talks to the access point, right? Um, so it's the kind of a physical addressing which is provided by the Ethernet card. And then I have the network layer. So that's what gives me the IP address, right? So the internet protocol is kind of giving everybody an IP address and then routing on the IP layer can happen. And then I have some sort of a you know, uh, session or some sort of end-to-end -end communication between me and the server, right? So that's where, where I'm using TCP, right? So I kind of went from physical, um, ethernet, IP, TCP. And then I'm kind of uh, doing something extra. So I'm using kind of a, a communication between my kind of a client node and the, and the server. And then we have kind of a data presentation and description layer. So here we could have HTTPS, uh, for example. And then I have kind of a particular protocol, application protocol of whatever my application is doing, right? So the, the, those three are sometimes intermingled a little bit. We don't isolate them very clearly, but all the way up to here, we kind of really have a very nice encapsulations and kind of boundaries. Why we do that this way? Why we have this model and why I am communicating this way with the GitLab server? Some ideas? Yeah? Yeah, for every layer, So it allows us to kind of isolate certain layers and have a kind of a clear interface between them 
and then don't worry about the dependencies, right? So if something changes here, if I'm changing a Wi-Fi to fiber optic, it still works, it doesn't matter, right? Uh, if I'm changing, uh, uh, like if there is an improvement of making internet faster, it's fine, it, it, everything else will work. Like the lower level and the upper level have a very well-defined interfaces, and then the improvement are kind of encapsulated to the layer itself, and it's kind of independent, right? So the improvements on any of those layers doesn't influence my behavior of the application layer, but makes the improvement, like performance-wise or whatever that is, right? Um, so we do that to kind of enhance the encapsulation and the isolation of various components of our system, and it's the same here. So we had a lecture about uh, blockchain technology, which is one example of peer-to-peer -peer, uh, communication. It's not necessarily mobile, but it's uh, kind of an example of a peer-to-peer -peer system. And then typically what, what happens is we have kind of the, uh, the network stack, right? So we have kind of a infrastructure that we use. Typically it's a TCP IP. Uh, so we're kind of relying on the normal traditional TCP IP stack to build kind of function, functionality on top of that. And then uh, what happens is usually there is kind of another network um, layer which is related to P2P net, um, network. Like how the hosts are identified, how the hosts kind of uh, know about each other and how they kind of um, become to exist in the P2P setting, right? So we have kind of a TCP IP layer, we have the P2P layer. And then usually what happens is on the P2P layer, we have something which we kind of refer as gossip. Um, some implementations actually call it a gossip protocol. Some call it something else like a messaging layer. But the idea is that you can exchange messages between the nodes, right? Uh, so there is no semantic necessary attached to the messages. It's just that, like, here we have kind of a communication, so we kind of can send packets. Here we have hosts, uh, which are connected. And here we have hosts that are connected, which can pass messages between each other, right? And then this is kind of independent. This is independent, and that's the kind of underlying stack that we're using. And then on top of that, we build some form of organizing what actually happens, right? So we have kind of the, like the, the business uh, business logic or application layer or some sort of a protocol uh, that uses the messaging layer to achieve some sort of consensus or transaction ledger or what, what have you, right? In our case, uh, the stacks will kind of probably be similar. It's up to you to, to, to investigate it, but you do need something for the P2P layer. You do need something for exchanging messages, and then the logic of the application is exchanging messages, right? Te text messages. But th those messages here are kind of um, not necessary human to human. They're kind of a peer to peer, right? So routers exchange messages, but they are not related to me talking to GitLab. They relate to the infrastructure of the internet, right? Uh, but they need to exchange messages as well, exchange routing tables and things like this. Um, so in here, we have uh, kind of a distinction between uh, data plane and control plane. So what is, what are those two? What are those two? What do you think? So that, that terminology comes from telecommunications networks. So let's say we have um, we have a telephony system, right? 
So I, I kind of have a wired copper telephone in my house. And then the copper cable goes to the an exchange. And then the copper cable goes to my friend's house. Right? And I want to establish the, the, the phone call. Right? Um, so what do I do to call my friend? I need to dial a number, right? So I'm dialing a number. So let's say one, two, three, four, five. And then by dialing the number, what do I do actually? I am talking to the exchange to establish, like I am directly connected to the exchange. When I pick up the, the phone, it's like, it gives me a signal. So like you're connected, you're connected to the exchange, right? Uh, in the old days, there was a person here, right? So I pick up my phone and say, oh, hello, operator. I want to call one, two, three, four, five. And she said, oh, wait a minute. Uh, and she kind of plugged the copper cables to the correct number and says, yep, you connected, you can talk now. Um, now we have kind of uh, electronic exchanges which do the same thing, right? So what it means is it basically has a number of connections coming in. One of them is me and it has a number of connections going out one of which is my friend, and I need this connection, right? And by dialing the number, it kind of does it. Uh, it's a very simplified model because I'm going to my street exchange, which goes to my city exchange, which goes to my country exchange, which goes, whoa, whatever, right? It kind of goes through multiple hops, uh, depending how the network is organized. If my friend lives on the same street, uh, it usually kind of needs to go up and down to the kind of country level because I have you know, as, as, um, a country code, city code, and then the actual exchange, right? So it has a hierarchy. But the, the bottom line is I kind of need to dial in and then I have the link established and then I can talk, right? So talking is a data play, right? Dialing in and communicating with the exchanges and establishing the link is the control play. Um, similar things you have um, and and in telecommunication network, even though I have this cable, a single cable, I am isolating how the control happens and how the data kind of flows, right? My data is voice and my control is kind of a specific uh, impulses that I'm sending to kind of dial in to control the what, what happens. Um, in Twitter, uh, I know you use Twitter. So you have a normal message or you have a direct message, right? Um, so a normal message has a text, which is uh, kind of limited in, in, in size, and then you just send it, right? Um, and that's it. Direct message has a text, but it has, um, I, I, I don't remember what the current in incarnation of the protocol is, but it used to have the followed by the username of the direct message recipient that you wanted, and then you have text, right? So this is data plane, but that part of the data plane is a control plane which tells the protocol what to do, right? It says that there is a direct message. Um, so uh, some solutions mix the data and control plane into a single way of doing things, and they're kind of managed by the same pipe, so to speak. And in some cases, we keep them separate, right? Uh, so in, in the context of um, telecommunication networks, SMS, for example, is basically, um, so when the telecommunications network were built, they had the data plane and control plane separated. And control plane was using simple, small messages to send between different hops and different uh, uh, nodes to configure them the way they need to operate. So the control plane was using kind of a messaging system, a uh, discrete messaging system to control things. Whereas data plane was using continuous kind of a voice, kind of analog, analog kind of a data for phone calls, right? And they were separate. This was using kind of a digital, uh, digital, uh, discrete messaging 
This one was using analog kind of a voice modulation for communication. And then at some point, uh, they said, well, we could kind of use that to send short messages between people as well. And that's what SMS is. SMS is a piggybacking on the control plane of the telecommunication systems to allow you to send short as, uh, text messages uh, between recipients using the control plane. But the control plane needs to be used for controlling the infrastructure. So they do that on a best effort service, right? So did it happen to you that you send SMS and it never arrived or it arrived like eight hours later? It happens, right? Uh, if the network is really busy, they need to use this messaging for their own control, then there is not enough capacity for the user messages to go through. They are deprioritized. The internal control plane is, takes priority, right? So this distinction between data plane and control plane is useful to have because in our case, we also need some sort of maintenance, some sort of control plane of how we organize the network, who is connected to whom. For example, uh, stay alive messages, like if I have a peer-to-peer -peer network and I am connected to, uh, so this is me, and I'm connected to three neighbors, and one of them goes out of life, like it disappears, go out of range or whatever. I need to know that, right? So maybe we need some sort of uh, staying alive messages, things kind of happening between the nodes, so I know that my neighbors are still alive, right? Or we have some announcement saying, oh, here I am, a new node, and I would like to connect to you, right? Uh, that has nothing to do with people chatting, with people messaging each other, but the nodes need to message each other to say, okay, I'm alive, or, oh, I'm shutting down, so I'm, I'm going off, right? So the, this message needs to go to the neighbors saying, I'm turning off, right? Um, so that would be control plane. So control, control plane is all the uh, management and um, logistic messaging, which happens on the kind of a ghosted layer or peer-to-peer -peer layer, uh, but it has nothing to do with people chatting, right? Uh, people chatting is the data plane, right? So if you kind of isolate those two, you will have a better separation of uh, responsibilities and how you achieve certain tasks. Also, if you isolate those interfaces here, you kind of make yourself independent of what happens on top, right? So one of the questions is, um, do we support group, group chat or do we support only individual messages, right? Um, so on the, on the data plane, do we have a concept of a group? Or do we only uh, send messages to individuals? And what implications does it have? On the control plane, you kind of don't have a choice. You need to have a concept of the group because I have my neighbors and my neighbors form a group. So if I need to tell them something, if, I, if I'm, for example, using the flooding algorithm, I will have a concept of a group built in, right? Uh, so I have a concept of the group built in, but it's not kind of a group of humans, it's a group of nodes. And then I can broadcast something to the group, right? Um, so control plane decisions might be separate from your data plane decisions, and then here you kind of de decide how the app behaves uh, from the user perspective. Here you decide how the app behaves from the tech perspective, from the underlying infrastructure perspective, right? Um, and identifying those interfaces, like uh, what, you know, how do we use TCP IP? Do you want the TCP IP to be the interface or do you want to use something here in this, in this spot? So for example, there are some, um, you know, TCP IP uh, allows a, a, the, the biggest flexibility because you can pass whatever, right? You just need to open a socket and then open a TCP socket and then you can pass messages. Maybe you even want UDP, right? Um, so it kind of gives you a very uh, flexible um, infrastructure, but on top of that, you want some sort of logic. So for example, you want messaging logic. You want kind of be able to just pass messages, right? Uh, so you can use some sort of uh, building block, which is called messaging bus. Uh, messaging bus. And there are different ones. There are synchronous ones, asynchronous ones, group-based ones, 
publish subscribe ones and so on. Have you worked with any of the messaging buses before? Like Zero MQ or RabbitMQ or other ones? They are like for every language you have one and for every kind of uh, infrastructure you, you, you have one, right? Um, that isolates you from the underlying kind of a protocol because now your interface is this bus, right? If it uses publish subscribe, then you have a kind of a well-defined API of how things happen. Um, if you're using something else, then you're kind of lifting your, your abstraction layer a little bit up. Um, so depending how you want to organize it, depending how you want to um, define those interfaces, you may benefit from the inspiration of the OSI layers by organizing your kind of stack accordingly, right? So for the requirement team, uh, they don't care about the kind of the, uh, the lower level uh, uh, implementations. They kind of start from here and they kind of work down. They specify what the user sees and what the user kind of can achieve using the application logic, which means that the down the stack protocols needs to kind of support that, whereas the technology group, the tech spec guys, are kind of designing that and kind of working up what is offered to the business logic. Uh, is the concept of the group kind of visible here so then uh, users can sign, sign up to a group? Um, with groups, it is kind of non-trivial um, for the for the from the user perspective. From uh, from the control plane perspective, we will definitely have to have a concept of the group. But for the uh, from the user perspective, it's kind of interesting because um, so if we have a sender and then the recipient. Right, and then we have to obfuscate one of them so then the link is not clearly visible. And we were saying, okay, let's keep the recipient um, public, but the, the sender we kind of hide, right? So we kind of have messages which we don't know from where they originated and they kind of go to a well-known recipient. Um, if we disintermediate that and if we say there is a concept of a group, um, and everybody can become a member of the group at any time or leave the group. So we, we kind of using publish, um, publish subscribe um, pattern, then when the message comes in, it kind of gets to the group and then it's broadcasted to all the current members of the group, right? Um, and then uh, the, the person can, can join the group uh, listen to some messages and leave the group. Uh, and then the timing, like if, if we're sending messages to recipient um, in time, we can kind of accumulate how many messages that recipient had. But if the recipient can join and leave the groups, that creates additional complexity of tracking because a recipient can be a member of arbitrary number of groups, which this immediate, this intermediate the communication, right? So I would need to keep track of the membership of the groups and the timing of messages to be able to tell if somebody was or not receiving all those messages, right? Which makes much, much more com complex of actually tracking if that person was or not uh, using the, uh, the messages. And those groups can be uh, private, right? So if we allow people to create uh, private groups which are not publicly visible, but only visible to particular subset of members, then I, like, if I'm a, a vulnerable node, I may not even know that there is a group which has three members and then somebody was sending message here and those three members got it, right? So it kind of enhances our privacy, even if, if the group is just one to one, right? Uh, so we may say we don't allow groups to be bigger than one member, but even introduce, introduction of single member groups already enhances our kind of our privacy considerations and the, this, in, in, this intermediation between the recipients and the senders. So that's kind of a, 
uh, an, an interesting dilemma of uh, from the user point of view whether to deal with the groups or not. Another one, another interesting one, so, so one is groups. Uh, another one is um, anonymity. anonymity. So if we say we want to preserve privacy and I want to communicate with Christopher, I need to know which of the nodes or which of the identities is Christopher, right? Uh, because he will appear ra anonymous, random to everybody else, but to me, I need to know that he is him, right? So I need to have kind of au <laughs> authentication somehow. So maybe through public private key cryptography, uh, he gives me his public key and then I know that if you know, he sent me something and I can verify the signature or whatever that that was him. Uh, but that leaks information also, right? Uh, unless he encrypts the, 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 um, the message with my key, so only I can see it. Like if people kind of want to be anonymous, uh, then the use of public private key cryptography is a little bit tricky because then the public key should not really be public because if it is really public, then you can link you have kind of a linkability, right? So if uh, if Christopher signs a message with his uh, uh, private key and I can validate it using his public key, then anybody can validate that that was Christopher's message. And we kind of lose this uh, hiding of the sender, right? But we need, I need to know that the message is from him. So then I don't have civil attack, right? Uh, so I don't get a message which says it's from Christopher, but it's not from him, right? So again, there are trade-offs. There are kind of a, you know, you have to think how to give the user the ability to verify or validate or how to, you know, um, how to enforce the, the legitimacy of the communication. So for example, are you using any communicator like a telegram or signal? Who is using any of the messaging uh, apps? Nobody? Yeah, what do you use? Yeah, so using, let's say, WhatsApp. So how do you know that the message to your friend is going to your friend? Or that the message from your friend is going from your friend? <laughs> yeah. So in, um, in WhatsApp, do you have to have a phone number? Exactly. So that's the source of truth, right? So in, in Signal is the same. So when you start the app, you have to provide your phone number. And then you can only have one, right? You cannot spoof somebody else's phone number because they send you back a SMS to verify that you actually own the phone, right? So that means a civil attack is kind of uh, addressed by... SMS and kind of a phone number. So they identify people not by public private key cryptography necessarily, but by the kind of unique phone numbers. And then if the message is from a person who owns a particular phone, then you sort of are guaranteed that that is that person, right? But if your friend loses their phone or if they kind of, they, they phone get hacked, you will get a message from somebody who pretends to be your friend, but it will, you will be believe it's from your friend, but it will not be, right? Um, so again, you have on the user side, you have uh, typical tricks of uh, doing kind of authentication and security. So it's, uh, you know, something somebody has, something you have, something you know, or something you are, right? So this is like for biometric, this is for like a password or something that is only in your head, and this is something that you, you have a possession of. So, you know, uh, SMS is proving that you have the physical phone, you have the SIM card, which has the particular phone number. Uh, if the there is a login or if you need to provide kind of a password or biometric to unlock the app, you're combining this 
with, with one of those two, right? Most apps do, that, do have that, or they rely on the phone uh, authentication to kind of uh, get access to the, to the app itself, right? Uh, if you're using all three uh, multiple times, then you're kind of enhancing the, the privacy, right? And um, authenticity of the communication. So, you know, again, trade-offs, like you can make it really secure and really reliable, uh, but then it's very unusable. It's kind of hard to use and kind of non-convenient. Uh, or you can say, okay, the trade-off is like, we use a phone number or we use, you know, something else. Uh, with, um, with mobile phones, what you could do is, you could rely on the physical proximity, right? So for example, if I have a phone, I can generate a unique key pair for my public private key cryptography, but I can use what's called, um, so I can use something that is called trusted execution environment. It's built in into all mobile phones already. Um, have you heard about this? Um, have you heard about hardware security? <coughs> so what, what's hardware security? So what's software security? We have a black box. And uh, the box uh, is giving me software secu security. What does it mean? So if I have uh, Christopher here, and we're communicating through the box, and the box gives me a software security, ma making sure that what I get is what Christopher sends. We have kind of some sort of software, usually some sort of a crypto protocol or algorithm, which ensures that whatever the properties we want is kind of maintained, right? And it's really hard to circumvent it because of this software or crypto protocol that is kind of here. Uh, but it's kind of algorithmic, it's kind of in software. But if the box is a physical box, so if I have a physical device, and the box physically cannot be tampered with, or if it's tampered with malfunctions, then I have a physical security, right? So I have physical security in the bank, in the safe, because the safe is in a physical location and I have to get there, right? It's the same um, in mobile phones. So in the mobile phone, you have a normal operating system stack and the normal uh, vulnerabilities related to that. So some, someone kind of a circumvent the DM of something that those crypto algorithms work on, then I have potential security leaks. But on the mobile phone, we have kind of a secure chip, which allows us to do hardware level encryption and hardware level protection of data that is not accessible from the operating system. So you can store like a private key or you can store something there and it's not accessible to anybody. Like nobody can get access to it because it's, uh, it's kind of a locked in hardware in a kind of a silicon and you would need to use a you know electron microscope to actually get to it right uh, like physically you can't physically and algorithmically you can't get so here I can store a private key in this trusted execution environment and even Christopher will not be able to to get access to it so I have my private key in my phone and he has it in his own right and then what we can do is we can export the public key and kind of uh, use a QR code or, or, or some sort to exchange information between our phones. And once we do it once, I know who he is and that I can trust his communication and I can also trust that his private key is never going to leak anywhere because it's kind of bound physically to his phone. So it's the same as with SMS uh, where we use a hardware security because of what? What's that? It's a unique identifier of your SIM card, which is physically burned into your SIM card. And there is no 
second SIM card with which has the same unique identifier. And there is a certain cryptography, cryptographic protocol which validates that your SIM card is legitimate from the operator and that it was not um, circumvented. Yes, there are some hacks. You can use some kind of a spoofing of the phone numbers to send and receive SMS messages. So SMS itself is not secure, but the SIM card hardware protection is secure and some banks use that. So for some internet banking, you have to have a SIM card which supports this level of hardware security. So then the SIM card validates that the SMS or the message that was sent to you was actually to that SIM card, not to the phone number, right? Um, I'm using a, a, a bank in Norway which enforces that. So I had a SIM card which was not supporting that and they said, you need to upgrade your SIM card. And then once upgraded, I am kind of able to use mobile ID uh, with them because of the SIM card hardware security. So you could have kind of, um, kind of enhanced security models where you rely on the, on the trusted execution environment of the device itself and the proximity that I'm, I, I need physically, right? So if I need physically someone, I can scan a QR code or I can do NFC or can do something to exchange the key. And then from now on, I know that he is a trusted uh, person, trusted sender or receiver. If you're using online system, of course you, can, you cannot do that, right? So how could you trust an online person that it's that, that person, right? Usually what we do, we, we trust the very first time the communication happens. Like, you know, uh, your mom says, oh yeah, hi, it's, it's me. And then she tells you, I, I just texted you to, to kind of hook up. And then you, you confirm it and then you trust that, that link, right? Or if someone sends you a public key. Uh, we store the public keys in the registries, usually associated with the email address. And then we sort of trust. We, we need to root the trust somewhere. Uh, and then everything kind of builds on, on top of that. Um, so you kind of need to make the, the sort of decision about how to prevent civil attacks and how to provide kind of anonymity or trusted communication between the sender and the receiver. Um, and then we, we already spent the discussion on the, on the metadata. Metadata and kind of uh, information leaks. You will leak, you will leak some information. That's kind of unavoidable. But what will you leak and how severe it is and like how managed that is. So, uh, you know, for efficiency sake, we need to do some routing. We need to identify the, the sender or the recipient. We need to use kind of a public private key cryptography which leaks the links between a person and a uh, public key um, and so on. So kind of analysis of what, you know, what happens in the network. Um, th that discussion has two caveats. Again, it has the data plane concerns, which are concerns for the uh, application layer for the users, but it also has the control plane implications. Right? What's the difference? So let's say we have a kind of a security flaw uh, in the in the data plane. Can you give me an example of some security um, implication? So let's say we can uh, identify uh, that Marius uh, is sending messages to Christopher, right? So this will be kind of a data plane um, leak, right? Uh, or a particular message that, that was kind of decrypted or improperly handled that uh, Mario said the exam is this for, for this course. And I send it to Christopher and somebody sniffed that and kind of have it in plain text, right? That would be this. So what would be the kind of the attacks or vulnerabilities on the control plane? Could be, so this is kind of more about the nodes, right? Um, and about the, the network itself. Uh, so like in the P2P network, uh, we have some hops, we have some nodes, we have some way of uh, authenticating the nodes and then kind of control plane leaks lead 
lead to the um, disclosure of some information related to the network itself. It's unavoidable, like we need to make some of this public, otherwise the network cannot function, right? But making this information public means the attacker can abuse it, right? So let's say we, you, you, you kind of went for a, a server uh, spoke topology, right? So one of the nodes becomes a server, and then you always have two hops to send messages to everybody, right? It's easy. You always send to the to the server, and then the server sends to whoever needs to get it, right? Uh, but this is a single point of failure. If this information is public and everybody knows about it, if you shut this node down, nothing can work. So this control plane vulnerabilities kind of expose the network to potential attacks, which can take the network down, right? It's not leaking kind of a information on the users, it's leaking the information about the network. Uh, so this kind of analysis also needs to kind of happen. Um, and that's why, for example, we don't use hub and spoke topologies because that kind of gives the single point of failure. We use kind of a random network or kind of a, a network which is sort of like a mesh-like where different nodes are randomly connected to different nodes. Uh, and then, you know, new node coming in can connect to, to random nodes, and then if you attack any of the nodes, well, you will take that node down, but the network overall health will kind of be maintained, right? Um, all right, so I will kind of close here. Um, you have some things to think. You will use your different group members as a resource, but you can also use me as a resource. So you can ask me questions and you can uh, put issues into the issue tracker. Um, and I will coordinate through the issue tracker about the group membership today. So hopefully everybody will kind of finish the uh, allocations today and we kind of settle who is where. Uh, and then we kind of carry on. Next week we will have a discussion on Lightning Network, which is another peer-to-peer -peer network which is using GOSIP protocol for communicating between the peers. Uh, and you can ask the, um, you can ask Rene about how it kind of works internally. Uh, and then after that, we will have another authentication authorization lecture about different models for doing um, authentication and preventing civil attacks. Um, and after that, we will kind of see like what, what guys will you need for your reports, right? Um, any questions? All right, so thank you for today.